Okay, there we are. Um, so funny, I feel like I'm out of practice with this. I don't know why that would be, because I do it way too frequently, really. I guess I'm just feeling something because I'm behind on doing my plant profiles that I never intended on doing. I don't mean to make these always be about me and how little time I have. It's sort of just on my mind, though, all the time. So week 10, here we go. This will be week 10 when you listen to this. Um, I think you'll already have had spring break. Won't that be fun? And hopefully I will have gotten everything graded to sort of a mountain that keeps getting bigger right now. Uh, so overviews and outcomes is already done except for this video. And then don't, you know, this will be gone by the time the module opens up. So on the 22nd, I'm hoping that y'all have already um, submitted if you want to do groups and oh, please, Oh, please be considering the groups would be a really ideal way to do this um, because if I have six landscape design projects to grade instead of 16, I might actually not lose my mind at the end of the semester, but it's not about me, is it? Okay, so anyway, landscape projects. So this is when we're just getting into this. Um, we're starting out this landscape project now. So, you know, I know you might be like, but I don't want to be landscape designer. I don't really care about that. I just want to know about plants or I just need to take a science class. And you're like, oh, crap. Anyway, we're going to do a landscape project because that's part of why um, this class exists. Honestly, it's one of the big requirements of class students to do this landscape design. Um, so the first step of that is to choose a site and then find a client and that client could be you So that's another reason why having groups would be good because then you're not like interviewing yourself which would be weird um, But rather you can have one of the people in your group interview you mm -hmm. You guys can all meet via zoom. It'd be great. So I also want to do this overview of the project I thought this was kind of a cute little thing. So old-school kind of the way I do stuff like that um, overview of this landscape project and I did this very fancy uh, project management technique called backwards design um, where I looked at like what needs to be done by the 7th of June which seems very far away but really is not uh, it needs to be done it needs to be done um, I think I'm actually flying no no not for a while it's my father's uh, service funeral service military honors South Dakota Anyway, but that's, that will give me a little bit of time. That will be good because we're not flying for another week. Okay, hooray, glad I figured that out. Um, so if that's due by then, what needs to be due before then? So the week before, I'd like to look at what you have and give you some feedback, like, you know, get going or this looks great, but what about this, this, and this? You know, helpful stuff. It's really just designed so that you can get lots of points, honestly, and feel better about the project that you've done and, you know, that's what it's for. Since I'm going to be the one grading them, getting my feedback is kind of a useful thing. Uh, before that, then, you'd need to have your designs in pro process, either with software, which I think in week nine you guys are critiquing that, so you should have already done that, or by hand if you're like, screw that, which is probably what I would be saying, um, trying to do that. Uh, but that's another good reason why groups are helpful, because you might have somebody who's like, oh yeah, I've done this before, or I've, I can figure this out, no problem. Groups, so good. Um, so for the week prior to that, you should have your base map complete and the list of plants you want to have, and then the zones and sectors. Like, are, is there like an ugliness zone? Like, oh, there's a bunch of trash cans there. We want to put something growing that will cover them up. Or like the noise sector zone, you know, like, wow, the neighbors play a lot of loud music and I want to put a, a little bit of a sound barrier there in, in shrubs. Um, whatever, right? Uh, the, and then the zones too, like what should be close to the house? Um, I know there's not edibles as part of this, but you don't have to say what edibles you plant there, but maybe as part of this dine, you put a little, a little, you know, four by four raised, actually raised is not such a good idea. Four by four sunken bed. Um, it helps get the water into the roots where they need it and doesn't bake the plants there on the south side of the raised bed, which happens here in Southern California. Um, you might put a little vegetable garden or, or an herb garden right outside the door, right? Like zone one. Um, you know, stuff that's maybe bigger, takes more room, doesn't need as much maintenance, goes towards the further away zones. Zone and sector planning started, and then the week prior to that, the ninth, um, deciding on if you want to have like a theme to your garden. Like, do you want it to be, a, is it a children's garden? Is this a family home? 
Um, is it like mid-century modern, you know, like show off our lovely uh, sculpted bushes garden or, you know, whatever. Um, so that's, you know, maybe medicinals, right? I know that there were several plants, I don't remember who that was, who was noting the medicinal properties of a lot of plants on the list. So it could be something with a medicinal focus, whatever, whatever you want. Um, interviews of the clients would be, need to be complete by then, a list of at least 30 plants. And then this is not necessarily part of this landscape project, but you will also be making a key to distinguish between those 30 plants, which really, to me, I think everybody should have this for their landscape, like a key to know the plants. So that instead of just like, oh, I don't know, it was just here when I got here, or like, oh yeah, our landscapers put it in, isn't it lovely? You, the, the people who live there can actually learn about their landscape, which I think is not a service that anyone has really promoted yet but I think that it has great uh, value and I think will seem to be even more valuable in the future as we have a lot of, um, you know, gardening, interesting gardening. People want to know and connect to the plants around them and to nature, especially with natives and pollinators and all that stuff. Anyway, so um, that's a separate thing. It's not necessarily part of this, but you'll use these plants to, to do your key. Your base map started that week. And then I think this is week 10. Groups assigned, which is the week prior when you pick that. Um, your site selection complete, the interviews planned, and design themes discussed by yourself in the mirror, I guess, or with your group group to get the, get the idea that I'm really hoping that you guys do this in groups. Um, and if that's like, what? Like, I just want to know what to do when. There you go. It's just right there. Okay. Um, next back to here. Oh yeah, so then um, here's the actual assignment for plant family tree. We're doing the asteroids. And I think last week I was drunk. Just kidding. I actually was not. Uh, but I'm like, wait, are these the super rosids? Or like, and then I was confused for a minute, which always happens when I'm on camera. It's great. It's really a handy uh, skill to have. Just have a camera at you and just lose your mind. Anyway, so those were not the super rosids. I went back in and I changed, uh, yeah, they're just the rosids. Okay, I went back there and I, I changed it to be accurate because I think I had gotten confused and put super rosids in there. Um, that group was the rosids. So these now are the asteroids, um, the super asteroids, right, that we talked about up here, um, includes more plants. And then the asteroids includes fewer plants. Um, the Ericales, which are part of the asterid group, and then the Lamiids. So remember, we always pronounce like all the consonants and vowels in, in when we're doing botanical Latin. The Lamiids um, are the group that we covered this week. And wonderfully, it's a smallish group. It's just the, the ones that we're covering. I think it was just the Boraginaceae um, family, which is in the Boraginales. Um, was the only one of the Lamians that we covered this week because then we have a lot of them to do next week. I didn't want to split up the groups so that we have characteristics that kind of stay the same. Anyway, so it's a light week. Oh, hooray! Um, so plant presentations for 126 to 140, and then we get into a little controversy. So this guy, I think, is, you know, I, I get, like, all, like, fangirl about people like David, David, sorry, What's his name? David Holmgren. I was also doing a bunch of Richard Evan Schulte stuff right now for my botany class, who is also <sighs> amazing. And also Nancy J. Turner. If you're into ethnobotany, she's somebody to look up. She's just phenomenal, these people and what they've done. So anyway, so he's one of the reasons why permaculture exists. And he's not like the big, showy, blustery, and also dead uh, Bill Mollison, who I didn't highlight because he is no longer alive. Um, David Holmgren is David Holmgren is very much alive, and I think just a very quiet and and wise, articulate person who talks about how permaculture started, and some stuff that I think is really helpful to know. And then just to add in the little bit of spice there, right? Um, so I don't know if you know Farmer Rishi. He's local. He's was in Diamond Bar, and I think now in Claremont, with um, I can't remember. It was the growing home is what he started doing. But now he has a bigger project in Claremont, and they're doing amazing um, edible varieties. You can They have a plant nursery, and he's got like 10 employees or something. I mean, he's doing really well. Um, 
But he also has a very sharp tongue. He's not, I'm tone policing, by the way, when I do that. But he's like really critical, particularly of permaculture, with this idea that um, permaculture is just uh, intellectual property theft, um, stealing from indigenous strategies. And so I would just love to hear your comments on that. And then um, just last night, in fact, um, Farmer Rishi uh, tagged me, see, because I'm so important, not really, um, but he did, so that's how come I saw this, this post by Shane Brown, who's not anybody that I know, but um, wrote up a, a rather lengthy and I think like a really um, cutting critique, but in a gentle way, really, but about why it helps to support some of what this, um, this is written by a whole bunch of, uh, I think, 10 different indigenous leaders and including um, Farmer Rishi, uh, I can't remember, Whitewashed Hope. It's called Whitewashed Hope. And then this is um, a take that, that, that explains some of it by Shane Brown. So I think it's really valuable to read both of these things. And you might just be like, oh, yeah. Um, I know there's so much, so many feelings these days about um, inclusion and equity and the past and how we label things and all kinds of stuff. And sometimes feelings can be really um, on the surface. So anyway, there you go. There's some stuff for you this week. Just want to make sure I'm not forgetting anything. Of course, I'm almost forgetting that. My brain is not attached. Um, okay, so for y'all who are doing this research this week, we've got Salvia Lucantha, Salvia Spathacea, Spathacea, I think I've said that before whatever, right? Just pronounce it however it makes sense to you. Spathacea is what it looks like here, but I wonder if I maybe missed a letter. Sometimes I do that. Scabiosa columbaria. It's a pretty, 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 pretty thing. Scavola emula. Scavola emula. I remember this from when I used to work at the Arboretum and Fullerton. I loved this. Um, Tolbegia violacea. This is a wonderful thing to eat. Really beautiful purple flowers in a salad. They taste and smell like garlic. Xantidecia. I've never said that out loud before. Athiopica. Athiopica? Huh, whatever. Okay, Antirhinum magus, which is snapdragons, which I have growing right now, and they're gorgeous. Calendula officinalis, which is another cool, weather-loving um, thing that has a lot of medicinal properties, too. Catharanthus roseus. Um, Vinca, which is horribly invasive. I should make sure to put that in there. Um, you go find it all over by the Rose Bowl, um, the Arroyo Seco there, growing wild. Also quite medicinal, though, by the way. Celosia plumosa. Um, they're wonderful. Bedding types are like this tall, but the ones that I grow um, are, you know, for fl flowers, and they're really tall and lovely, and they come in lots of varieties, and they love warm weather, right? That amaranthaceae thing. Cosmos bipinatus. Gorgeous things, if you can get them to grow well and not be devoured by aphids, let me know. Um, cyclamen persicum, the florist's cyclamen, which is odd. I don't think people use it in cut flowers, but I think they often um, send cyclamen plants, you know, if you call a florist from far away. Dahlia hybrid. So these, again, these are the bedding dahlias. These are like this tall, and they're cute. They're cute little things, not the uh, big, tall dahlias that kick my butt every year because I spend so much time and money and effort on them and then I get like, you know, three flowers. Anyway, Eustoma grandiflorum. This is a wonderful plant in the Gentianaceae, the Gentianiales, um, Lysianthus. I mean, it's, it looks like a little rose and they're, they're way hardier than you would think. This, this is, they're a pain in the butt to grow from seed, but they, they're really, really neat plants um, and they're quite hardy. Impatience, Walleriana. I don't know. I think I have a rash about impatience because my yucky neighbor who did a lot of the landscaping in this house before we moved in planted it everywhere. And that's it. That's it for this week. I'm done taking up your time. Bye.